Hey friends, we're on the ground in Tampa and we're excited to have you with us. Joining me today is football legend, NFL Hall of Fame coach, and one of the best men you'll ever meet, Coach Tony Dungeon. Coach, we've got the Buccaneers and the Chiefs. What's it gonna take for each team to win? I think mirror images, Benjamin. Both teams, pressure defense. Both teams, great quarterbacks, explosive offenses. Who can make the big plays? Who can stop the other team from making the big plays? And what it's gonna come down to, as you know, pressure on the quarterback. They always say you got to get these quarterbacks off the spot. You can't just let them sit there and pick you apart. Well, whoever wins, this game is going to be one for the ages. So welcome to the Super Bowl and welcome to Football Sunday. Do you remember where you were last year for the Super Bowl? Yeah, I do. <laughs> Probably at a Super Bowl party, just enjoying other people and standing less than six feet apart. But our world changed in a heartbeat, right? And that's what makes what I'm about to say even more important. In Psalm 16, 8, David gives us words to live by, especially in the middle of the unknown and the uncertain. He says, I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. In our time together today, we'll discover how that truth can be experienced in our own lives. This really is the life we're invited to live. This is what it means to be unshaken. Our first story comes from NFL linebacker Sam Macho. Sam has had a successful nine-year career in the NFL and has become an influential Christian leader, not only in the locker room, but in the world as well. And all along the way, Sam continues to discover a God who is always enough. Freshman year, University of Texas, college campus, Jester Hall, third floor right outside of the elevator. Trevor Walker, that is third string quarterback, just waiting, reading his Bible. And so I stop, and then maybe he stopped me, and, and we just start reading a little bit, talking a little bit, but it was at that point I said, okay, something's different about this guy. He said, if you wanna be real about it, let's just be real about it, let's live out our faith on this campus, on the football team with the guys. And it wasn't just me or him, we had about 10, 15, 20 guys on our team that wanted something more. God just erupted inside of me and I felt like a lion. I felt like I was just a lion in those grounds. The men there had encountered Jesus. It was the last thing I ever would have expected going to a prison. And I still keep in touch with a bunch of those guys today from that prison. I went back the year after, I went back the year after. And no matter if you're black, if you're white, if you're, a pri if you're in prison, if you're a football player, if, no matter who you are, God can restore and redeem. And I saw that with my own eyes. So I had just signed um, a multi-year, multi-million dollar contract in the NFL. I mean, it was like, yeah, we did it, we did it, man. God is good, oh, everything's gonna be okay. And it wasn't. Right around that time, just the seams started to fall apart in my life. My relationship with my wife, and Ghazi, blessing, right? I wasn't loving her the way I was called to love her. Even with my kids, I found myself getting angry with them often or being anxious all the time. My parents just seemed like it was just falling out with every, a lot of people, everyone and everything around me. And I was sitting down at a, at a restaurant in Chicago with one of my buddies. And I finally just got a chance to tell my mother, dude, I'm struggling. I am not doing well at all. And as I'm sharing with him everything that was going on, I'm, I'm sharing and I'm actually, I'm like, I started to cry. And he looks at me and he says, it's really nice to see you, Sam. He said, as long as I've known you, I've never seen this side of you. I've always seen the, the, the smile and the, the jerseys and I've never seen this side of you, but it's good to know that you're human. like but I just was exhausted I felt like I was carrying a lot of weight and my teammate who walked in and he saw me 
He says, hey, Acho, are you good? I looked at him and said, you know what? I'm not. He said, I don't know what's going on right now, Sam, but whatever it is, you, you need to let it out. I look at him and, and all of a sudden, now I'm in the locker room now and the tears start to come. He looks at me and says, hey, Ach, it's nice to see you. So many of us, we get trapped and caught and, and God's like, no, I see you. Let me move this weight off you. The weight I've been trying to carry was this weight of perfection. Right? I have it all together. I have all the answers. I'm the star. I'm the guy. I'm great. And God's like, I didn't have you to carry that. I want you to get to know me and to spend time with me. That's all I want. I am enough, not you. I am enough. It is so easy to pretend to act like we have it all together and put on our, you know, these figurative masks that we wear and be like, yeah, I'm fine. I'm good. It's so easy. But God is not a God of pretending. God is a God of freedom. The Bible talks about taking up your cross daily and following me. Am I going to take up my cross and be, be real, be authentic? Or am I going to pretend and act like I got it all together and act like I have all the answers? It's a daily decision. It really is a decision we make each and every day. We believe in God, but do we believe in a God that's really enough? You know, Sam's in a professional locker room and he's sitting there and he's got a problem. Somebody recognized that one of his teammates said, hey man, you're okay. And we've all been there. How much courage would it take to say, no, I'm not okay because I'm trying to do this myself and I'm not okay. And that courage comes when we're vulnerable. And for so many of us, we say we trust in God, but we really trust also in our accolades, and our success and what other people say about it. Absolutely, but there's good news, great news. As Sam said, God is not a God of pretending. He doesn't pretend with us, and he doesn't want us to pretend with him. So you wanna live a life that doesn't shake when the ground moves? That life happens when we keep our eyes fixed on the God who's so much more than enough. Coach, you and I both played in Super Bowls during our playing careers, and you actually coached in one too. <laughs> so we thought it would be fun to ask some guys who love God and who played in the Super Bowl about their experiences. Here's what they said. Uh, Super Bowl is a little bit different because you play so much later in the afternoon. And so I actually did get up and have a uh, Pretty good breakfast, you know. Basically, all the fixings, eggs and, uh, and toast. I've probably been eating the same thing before games now for the entirety of my career, and that's oatmeal and eggs. Omelet with some eggs and cheese, and then some bacon, and uh, pretty simple. I would usually hit the omelet bar, hit the pancake bar, definitely get some fruit. You know, running out, having my name announced, the flashbulbs going off, where it really sunk in that this is real, you know, that, that, that we're here in this moment that I dreamed of so many times, a moment that I played out in my front yard so many times. My favorite part by far was the parade, um, probably four or five days after the Super Bowl. Um, Philly was just out of control, and for as long, as far as you can see, it's just people everywhere. Before the game, and Jim Zorn, my quarterback coach, he said, uh, he got this like smirk on his face and he says to the quarterbacks, he's like, how cool is this? Like, how great is this? Like, what a blessing is this? And I was like, yeah, I mean, heck yeah, we're about to win the Super Bowl. And he was like, God is on the throne whether we win or lose. And even if we win, like, we're not really on the throne. He's on the throne. I had my oldest two children there on the field with me after the game. I had my father, my mom, my wife, my brother all there with me after the game. And just to share in that moment with him. I first met Brandon Cooks when he joined the Saints in 2014. As a football player, Brandon was fast. <laughs> like, levels, lightning, fast. We couldn't believe how fast this dude was at rookie minicamp. One day, Brandon approached myself and Luke McCown about getting baptized. We had been meeting with Brandon throughout the year on Saturdays before the games, just going through scripture, answering questions. So he said, you know what, I wanna get baptized. So we baptized him in the training room whirlpool that day in front of his teammates and coaches. 
A few years later, his faith would be tested when he and his wife Brianna were confronted with a significant health challenge, one that's common, but not often talked about. This is your story. One of her friends was dating one of my teammates and she would come to the field. You know, I was able to take her on a date and then from there on, you know, you give me the chance then, it's over from there. <laughs> and so we've been together since, since my junior year. I've been a headache probably, but you know, she loves me and I love her and she's, she's a special girl. From there on, we were trying to get pregnant. We, we knew we wanted to start a family right away once we got married. And so we were trying since 18 and, um, you know, going, it wasn't going too well for both of us. Like, we just got to keep having faith. Well, unfortunately, you know, they said we weren't going to be able to have kids naturally you know, because their tubes um, were messed up. And so we had to remove those. So then I'm like, oh, wait a minute. When you hear that, I'm like, then how can you have kids? Over 100 shots for the egg retrieval. And once we did that, she still had to stay on the shots to trick the body saying that, you know, she's, she's pregnant. And that was hundreds of more shots. We went to New Zealand in January, right after the season. And she had all her, had her shots, her syringes. Just if she missed a day or two, really a day, then it messed up the process. You know, she's getting shots on the plane. She's like, oh, I gotta, it's whatever time it is, I gotta go do my shot. We're on the plane. We land, gotta do my shots. And I'm like, I mean, all I can do is just comfort her, really. And the process that, women have to go through that, that do the IVF, um, they're warriors. There's without a doubt, without a doubt. And we get the call and they're like, well, and we're like, oh, they go, you know, you're pregnant. And we're like, wow. But then we look at each other like, really? Like, this is the way we find out, like, you know, naturally, you're like, okay, you know, take a pregnancy test. So then we get home, she's like, I'm still taking a pregnancy test. We're still going to take the photo for memory. <laughs> we head over to the hospital. It's about three in the morning now. And on our, on our note, she goes, if I ask for epidural, that's just because I'm in pain. Encourage me not to get it. So we get to the point, she's like, I want the shot. I'm like, I'm reading off the notes. Like, you told me, like, you got this. No, I want it. I'm like, okay. <laughs> the love that Christ has for us, that God has for us, is, is was magnified when I had my own child. I now understand, like, it's no brainer why God loves us so much now. It's, it's just a different, it's just a different meaning now. It's a different meaning. When you hear a story like that, it's hard not to see the sovereign hand of God. And we've all been there, and it's tough, even though you have faith, to say, I understand God, even when it doesn't make sense. And God is in control, even when it doesn't make sense, but it's still painful. And it's important that we realize that. We're all still living through a pandemic. Your finances, your health, your small business, your personal losses, a death in the family, all these things are happening during this time. And our families are living through these things too. Our families are so important. And they've been impacted by COVID during the past year, not just us. It can all feel very uncertain and at times even overwhelming. But I know this from years of personal experience. Whether it feels like it or not, God is sovereign in these things because God is sovereign in all things, even the uncertain things, even a pandemic. 
And maybe you just needed to hear a coach say that one time. God is sovereign in the pandemic. With the strength of God empowering us, we really can be unshaken. By focusing and continually focusing our eyes on a God who is sovereign over all of it. I think when you wake up or get up in the morning, it's early. And I think the, the first thing you think of is, did that really just happen? Did that game just happen? It seems like a dream. I was more excited because the following Saturday after the first Super Bowl victory, I was getting married. We were so close and we had a great year. And I feel like we were probably one of the best teams, if not the best team in football that year, but we didn't get it done on Super Bowl Sunday. Like five or six of us had to go to play in the Pro Bowl right after that. And all of a sudden we're on the beach sitting next to all the Pittsburgh Steelers that just beat us in the Super Bowl. And it was kind of, it was a little bit difficult, quite honestly. Like you wanted to be angry at them and bitter and all this. And then Troy Palomalo's playing catch with your kids and keeping them occupied for two hours. And you're like, well, he seems like a really great guy. You know, I think it was simply just the appreciation for the opportunity. When I look back at uh, everything that went into those seasons, the ups and downs, uh, it's the relationships that really stick out. And to have it play out the way that it did and to win the Super Bowl and find yourself, you know, the morning after, being able to reflect on that and just being grateful. As we talk about living a life that's unshaken, we need to be honest about something that's shaken all of us in the last year. In one way or another, the issue of racial justice has risen to the surface in our country and in our conversations. I recently sat down with two former players who come from different racial backgrounds and who've been best friends for 30 years. John Kidna and Eric Bowles met on the football field at Central Washington University. Eric signed with the Jets, John signed with the Seahawks. These guys are not only influential Christian leaders, but they're best friends who model a relationship where hard conversations on race are normal and even invited. Here's the interview with Benjamin, John, and Eric. What does it look like for two believers who know each other, but first and foremost are, are Christians? How do you address these issues together? I gotta put what the Word of God says first. Now, if that's what I'm gonna put first, my willingness to have real conversations with others. And it, it has to come from, so when we talk, we've been doing this for years though, bro. It isn't like we're having deep conversations about racial uh, conciliation and race stuff. We've been having that from the beginning. John 17, John 17. This is when my grandma always says that this is the Lord's prayer. Cause this is actually when Jesus is praying for his disciples. So this is his prayer. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in their message through them, that all may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. His purpose in unity was not just to get along. His purpose in unity was so that the world may believe that you sent me. We can look at this huge worldly problem and wonder how it get fixed. Well, it gets fixed by starting with the individual. Starting with the individual, what is our basis for truth? Do we really believe the Bible? Do we really believe that God made man and woman in his image? Because if he made man and woman in his image and for us to hate or have some sort of prejudice towards someone else because of what the color of their skin is or their cultural background or whatever it is, then what we're saying is, I, truly, I hate God. Yeah. In this arena, what does repentance look like for an individual, for a family, for a church, for a nation? Repentance is an acknowledgement of the of falling short of God's standard, and then saying, okay, as a result of that. Here's what needs to change. Here's what things I need to do differently so that I don't keep falling short of what God's standard is. And so when you're talking about in this area, we all have to ask ourselves, 
when I see a certain person, when I see a person that looks like this or comes from this kind of background or I'm driving in a certain area, does it stir things up in me? Or do I see certain people and show favoritism to a person that looks like this as opposed to a person that looks like that? All that stuff is non, that's non-biblical. God, it was called out over and over in scripture. And at some point, the word of God is supposed to be, it's sharper than a two-edged sword. It doesn't supposed to feel good. It's And I don't know if enough people have had any, have experienced slicing and dicing that the word does. Like that good hurt. You know what I'm saying? If we're being real, if we're, if we're being real, we should be confessing and repenting hundreds of times a day. Being diverse in skin tone is not the same as being diverse in thought. And so it's okay to have diverse thinking. It's okay to have people who think slightly different and it all falls under the cross. So, you know, my encouragement, my charge to the church is like, let's not be afraid. Let's not like put up borders and try to keep people out. Man, the Bible tells us to go out into all the world and connect. We don't have to be afraid of the world. Like actually, like scriptures already says that the, 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 the gates of hell should not prevail against it. Like we keep acting like we're playing on defense, man, bro. Look, look, blitz, throw the ball deep. <laughs> man, let's run up the score and now's the time to do it. Man, I love those guys. And, and I love what Eric said about the church. We don't need to be afraid of the world because we have Jesus and Jesus told us perfect love casts out fear. So we don't need to be afraid. Exactly, I love this interview, but also we have a mandate as a church. We can't sit back and watch these things happen. We have to get involved with what's happening in the world right now. That's our job as the body of Christ. There's so much more to this interview, so much more. This is only the tip of the iceberg. So you need to go and see the rest of the interview with Eric and John. It's available at the Football Sunday website. Head to the site later today, experience it for yourself, but don't only, only experience it, do something about it. Our final story is from NFL quarterback Carson Wentz. During his five-year NFL career, Carson has experienced the ups and downs of the game. But if you listen to his story, it's clear that his foundation lies somewhere else, in something else. This is Carson's story. Grew up in uh, Bismarck, North Dakota. Was extremely active in sports. That was pretty much my life. Parents got divorced when I was seven. I was a good kid. I stayed out of trouble. You know, we, we went to church. It was kind of just something we did. It's kind of something we checked the boxes, so to speak. And I thought I was right with God because I was a good kid. I listened to what my dad said. I didn't want to get in trouble. Didn't want to miss sports. Kind of all those things, all those factors in my mind made me think I'm good. And then I go to college and at that point it's, okay, you're no longer in your parents' house. It's time to grow up, make your own decisions. I remember one of our first practices, it was a senior quarterback at the time named Dante Perez. He ends up asking me, hey man, you ever read the Bible? It was our first practice. I just got done learning about two jet protection and what the X has on the certain plays and all these things, my head's spinning. And he wants to talk about the Bible and I'm kind of taken back. At the same time though, I was like, here it is, because I knew God was kind of moving. And from that moment on, him and I started talking. He was a mentor to me. We read the entire New Testament and met up, you know, at least once a week and, and talked through the word. And it just came to life to me. You know, it was really eye-opening to me. I always said I was a believer in Jesus, but I didn't really know what he did for me. You know, I thought it was all about what I could do for him. And when that kind of mindset was flipped on its head and that it was already done for me and that it was a thing called grace and I could live for him freely and not out of rules and obligation, it, it just changed my life. We met actually in the country of Haiti and she was there serving uh, with the organization called Mission of Hope. And this was after my rookie year went down on a mission trip with the, the church that we go to out here in uh, New Jersey. We ended up talking and I just, just to see another woman that, that was truly after God's heart in that moment um, and trying to serve him the way that uh, I was trying to live as well. About a year and a couple months later, we were married. And now we have a, a daughter who's uh, seven months old now and, and she is an absolute joy. It's been, uh, it's been quite the journey together so far. We were all on this 
on this high as a team. You know, I was um, in the MVP conversation and our team was, you know, we just clinched the NFC East and all sorts of good things going and uh, my season was done. And for me, I've, fa I've had a fair share of injuries, but never something like that. Never something where I literally had zero control of my life. I, I couldn't walk. I couldn't get off the couch to go to the bathroom by myself. I couldn't just complete control. I had to be surrendered. Believe me, I wasn't the best patient. I was frustrated. I was crabby. It was a trying time. But to look back at it and to see, you know, we go on to win the Super Bowl. Everyone knows that story. And, and I was not out there. And to walk through that, um, obviously it was tough at the time. And I still look back and think it was a tough time. But I know God was moving in my life. And he wanted me to know that he loves me so much that my relationship with him is far more important than winning a Super Bowl, than being on that stage in my uniform, than playing in that game, but ultimately playing for his glory and saying, God, your will be done. And just how God has had his hand from that moment on um, in my life. And, and I thank him for it. For me, I've always been a guy that, that wants to have control and my selfishness and my want, desire for control has to decrease every moment and it has to just allow God to increase in my life, to try my best to be spirit-led and not Carson-led. Sometimes I just look at my daughter and I kind of laugh because I'm like, she's mine. And the way I love her that I can't even explain or understand, I know doesn't even compare to how much God loves us. Almost makes me emotional sometimes because I'm just like, this is my daughter and God, you gave your son to die for, for me. And I'm like, I would never let anything happen to this little girl because she is mine. Like, because of how much he loves me, he was willing to allow his son to go through the agony of dying on that cross. And I think that is when the peace just rushes over me. And I think, all right, God, there's so much more at play than the X's and O's of football, than the highs and lows of wins and losses. And that gives me peace. If you're a football fan, you already know that Carson's season didn't turn out like he wanted it to. No, it didn't. But... It was his faith that's given him a perspective that's so much bigger than, you know, just the X's and O's of football. And it's really interesting to me, Benjamin, it was really the birth of his daughter that I think showed Carson that love that God has for us, that God is with us even through all the turmoil, even through all the problems. There's nothing better than coming back to the truth that we are unconditionally loved by the God who created us. And because of that great love, he gave his only son, Jesus, to live with us and to die for us. I love the way Paul puts it in 2 Corinthians 5, 19. He says that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. In Christ, when we're forgiven, we're reconciled back into that relationship that we were created for in the first place. So in times that are confusing, <laughs> like now, we can rest in the truth that the heart of God is always loving and is always pursuing a deeper relationship with us. Our time together wouldn't be complete unless I ask you the most important question anyone will ever ask. Have you been reconciled to God through Jesus Christ? God not only loves you, but He created you to personally experience that love in a relationship with Him. The problem is that we turn away from that relationship. We all have our different reasons for running away, but the Bible calls it sin. We all sin and we're born into it. And this means that when we pass from this life into the next, we're eternally separated from Him. But the great news is this, because of His heart to be reconciled with us, God gave His Son, Jesus, to die in our place, to pay the penalty that we deserve. Every time we see an image of the cross in our churches, our paintings, our jewelry, or anywhere, it's a reminder of the truth that Jesus paid the price so that we don't have to. And it just gets better. On the third day, Jesus rose again, overcoming the power of death, just like He said He would. But here's the thing. God still requires a response on our part. The Bible calls this response faith. It's the confident trust in what Jesus has done on our behalf. In a completely honest and unedited moment with God, we acknowledge that we're currently headed in the wrong direction, that we're not following the one who alone 
equals the offer of real life. So I just need to ask you, is today that moment for you? What if this is the day to turn in the direction of God and to say yes to His new direction in your life? The gift has already been given, and it's waiting for you to receive it and to open it. If that's your heart's desire, if it's time to enter into the very relationship you were created for in the first place, I'd like to invite you to pray these words as I pray them out loud. Dear God, thank you for loving me and for pursuing me all the days of my life. I fully acknowledge that I have pushed you away and I've lived my life apart from you. And for this, I am truly sorry. In this moment, I ask you to forgive my sins and to restore me completely back to you, back into the relationship I was created for. Jesus, I believe that you are God and that your death paid the penalty for my sins. And I believe that you rose again on the third day in victory over death. Today, I receive your gift of forgiveness and life. I will follow you wherever you lead. And I will be a reflection of you for the world to see. In Jesus' name, amen. If you just prayed that prayer, the Bible says that all of heaven is celebrating right now because the reconciliation that God has always longed for just happened with you. This will become the most defining moment of your life. So welcome home. Welcome to true and abundant life, both now and forevermore. Unshaken. When the ground beneath us is rumbling, this one thing is always true. We serve a God who cannot and will not ever be moved. And I hope you're hearing that message today. Maybe it's through Sam's story that God is more than enough. Or maybe it's through Brandon's story as God invites you to fully embrace just how sovereign he really is. Or maybe through Carson's story, he's reminding you that you are loved and that a relationship with you is worth the price of the cross. Whatever the case, we're so grateful you joined us today. So on behalf of Sam, Brandon, Carson, John, Eric, Benjamin, and the entire team at Football Sunday, thanks for joining us. And as we wrap up our time together, may we become people who write these words on our hearts. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With Him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Let's get ready for some football. Enjoy the Bucks yes. and the Chiefs. Have a great day.